This video is supported by Skillshare. The age and the size of the universe go hand in hand. And that's something we've been trying to figure out since we first realized that, that those lights in the sky are stars just like our own sun. So maybe it shouldn't be a surprise that the person who cracked the code was a literal human computer. What might be less obvious is that it was a woman. And she was deaf at that. Her name was Henrietta Swan Leavitt, and she worked at the astronomy department at Harvard, even though she couldn't go to school there because Harvard didn't allow female students at the time, the time being 1898. But yeah, back then, computers were people. That was a job. You know, the astronomers would give numbers uh, based off their observations to the computers. They would go off and do their calculations and come up with the answers. There were entire rooms full of math whizzes with slide rules in order to do the things that we can do today on our phones. And most of these computers were women because it was considered a non-creative support role. So, you know, they could go crunch their little numbers and leave all the thinking to the men. Welcome to the world before fairly recently. Actually, real quick, there's a corollary to the film industry here because early on in the film industry, most of the editors were women because for the same reason, it was considered a non-creative support job. All right, darling, all you gotta do is cut after we say action and before we say cut. You think you can handle that, sweetheart? Here, go get yourself some more lipstick. There you go. But many of these early editors took this support job and made a whole art form out of it and completely changed filmmaking forever. You know, innovators like Thelma Shoemaker, Dee Dee Allen, Anvi Coates, and Verna Fields, they just completely reimagined the art of visual filmmaking and became legends amongst filmmakers. Similarly, Henrietta Swan Leavitt took this support role and created the tools that opened up the universe to us. Officially, her job was curator of astronomical photographs at Harvard. And in this position, she was able to gain an insight into certain stars called Cepheid variables. What she realized is that these stars pulse, and they pulse at a rate that tracks with their brightness. So if you're looking at a Cepheid star, you can time the pulses and figure out how bright it is. So you compare that to the brightness that we actually observe, and the difference can tell you how far away that star is. This is known as a standard candle. And this was a game changer because there was a huge debate going on at the time about the scale of the universe. It was the cosmological crisis of the 1920s. Some people, like astronomer Harlow Shapley, believed that the Milky Way was all there was, that there were no other galaxies, that our galaxy was the universe. Another faction, led by Heber Curtis, believed that the Milky Way was just one of many galaxies, and those weird spiral nebulas that we're seeing up there are actually whole other galaxies way off in the distance. Shapley and Curtis had a back and forth series of papers that were disagreeing with each other over this topic. They were the, the diss tracks of their day. But ultimately, it was Edwin Hubble, who worked with Henrietta Swan Leavitt, who was able to put this debate to rest. He used Leavitt's Cepheid variable technique to prove that uh, th the universe is far more than just our one Milky Way. There are billions of galaxies out there, each one made up of billions of stars. The universe just kept getting more ridiculous. So this pretty much sealed Hubble's fate as a legendary figure in astronomy, but while solving that cosmological crisis, he kind of set up another one. The one that we're dealing with right now. The crisis came because while studying these galaxies, Hubble realized that they were all moving away from each other, but not just that they were moving away from each other, but the further away the galaxies were, the faster they seemed to be receding. This means the universe is not only expanding, it's expanding at an increasing rate and this rate has become known as the Hubble constant. And it was recognized pretty much right away how important it was to get this number accurate because it not only told us how the universe begins, it also tells us how it ends. Because if the universe is expanding in all directions, that means that 10 minutes ago, it was a little bit smaller than it is now. And it was a little bit smaller 10 minutes before that, and a million years before that, and a billion years before that. It just keeps getting smaller. You can see where I'm going with this. This was proof of the Big Bang. And that was a big debate that was going on at the time too. Some scientists believe that it came out like that. Some believe that it was static and infinite like uh, Einstein once upon a time did. Others believe that it was finite but static. There was a lot of debate over it. But this changed everything. This proved that the universe had a beginning and that it would likely continue to expand forever. So Hubble put his brain on trying to calculate what this constant might be and he came up with 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. A megaparsec is about 3.3 million light years, so basically for every distance of that that you look out, beyond that, it is expanding 500 kilometers per hour per second more than the distance before it. You got that? Now, unfortunately for Hubble, this couldn't have possibly been right because this would have made the beginning of the universe to be about 2 billion years ago, and geologists had already dated the Earth at far older than that. And it also implied that the Milky Way would have been a monster galaxy, like way bigger than any other galaxy in the universe. So he was, he was way off. 
But in the 90 years since then, Hubble's constant has been refined and recalculated over and over again using much better technology, including the telescope that bears his name. And it began to settle around 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And then everything changed, starting in about 2009. The numbers went from being bang on accurate and agreeing with each other, to disagreeing but within the range of error, to being fundamentally incompatible, assuming everybody was doing their math right. And this sets up our current cosmological crisis, which I will try to explain the best I can, but please bear in mind I'm not like a PhD in astrophysics from Oxford or anything like that. So what I did was I got somebody who exactly is that, and that's Dr. Becky Smethurst from the Dr. Becky YouTube channel. And we talked about it, she set me straight, and she's gonna chime in in this video. Dr. Becky Smethurst. Hello. <laughs> Did I say that right? Did I say your last name? Yeah, right? you said it perfectly, actually. Okay. All right, so there are two methods we can use to find the Hubble constant. There's actually several different methods that we can use, but I'm going to focus on two today. There's the distance ladder method and the CMB method. The distance ladder method is based on the standard candle thing that I talked about a minute ago. So it's basically like you figure out the distance to a nearby object and then use that to figure out a distance to a further object and then on and on and on like a ladder. For instance, one method you can use to calculate a nearby star is a simple parallax method. So when the Earth is on one side of the sun, uh, you take a measurement and then you take a measurement on the other side of the sun, do a little bit of triangulation, you can figure out how far away it is. And that works pretty well up to about 10,000 light years away. So you could think of parallax as the first rung of the ladder and then maybe red shifting might be the, the second rung of the ladder. It gets way more complicated than that. I'm simplifying it very much for this, but over time this method has been used to more and more accurately get to a, a Hubble constant. But in 2003, a new method entered the scene, and this was being done using the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, or the CMB. The CMB, it's come up quite a bit on this channel. I don't need to go too into detail on it, but it's basically the imprint of the Big Bang. Yeah, the energy created in the Big Bang got redshifted over time into the microwave range, and we can measure that. And in fact, you can hear some of that in the static over a radio antenna or TV signals. The CMB is super cold, only 2.725 degrees Kelvin, uh, and you've probably seen this map of the CMB around, but what you don't realize, at least I didn't realize this, is that the hottest and coldest parts of this map are only 0 0.0002 degrees Kelvin difference. It's kind of amazing that we're able to do this. Small though they are, these variations can tell us a lot about the early composition of the universe and the distribution of energy that then turned into the first atoms and matter, and we can kind of calculate back from there and figure out what happened in between. So when we first started using the CMB to calculate the age of the universe and the Hubble constant, uh, we were using the WMAP telescope, which was by far the most accurate way of doing it at the time, and the first calculations that we came up with, thankfully, were right in that same range, around 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So it lined up perfectly with the distance ladder method and the scientists were like, oh yes, that's it, that's oh, beautiful, bellissima, that's what you, that's the gesture you make when things work out the way they're supposed to, oh, right? Yeah, that didn't last long. Because with every technological advancement, our numbers became more accurate, but they also began to drift away from each other. And by 2014, they weren't compatible at all anymore. Everything that we do that's very local around us always comes out in sort of the 14 and a half-ish pile of evidence. And then everything that's done with the cosmic microwave background comes out in the 13.8-ish billion years evidence pile. And so we've got these two growing piles of evidence and everyone's a bit like, uh, <laughs> and we don't know if it's gonna turn out that there's something wrong with one pile of evidence or not, and then that'll bring the, the two piles together. Or if there's some new physics, some new hypothesis that explains why we're getting two different answers, and if we can account for that new physics, then that brings them together. Everyone was either working with the two bits of data and sort of ignoring each other and saying, no, 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 the other team must be wrong. There must be something wrong with what they're doing. Mm. Um, or they weren't considering any necessarily new physics. But then after that paper came out, it really was sort of like a, a kick up the butt basically for everyone to you know, say, okay, no, we, this has gone too far now. We need to actually figure out what is wrong here. And I think that's sort of the, the supernova people were like, yeah, they'll just find something wrong with the data eventually. It'll be, you know, there's nothing wrong with ours. We've been doing this for hundreds of years, you know. Because <laughs> the CMB one is pretty new, right? Yeah, so that uh, comes sort of from the last couple of decades when we managed mm. to get microwave telescopes into space and we could get 
which is sort of like the Kobe satellite, the WMAP satellite, the Planck yeah. satellite, have all done this. And so with that, we were able to get much more precise measurements that we needed. And the thing was, there was these two separate satellites, WMAP and Planck doing the same thing, and they both found yeah. similar results. So that would mean they both had a systematic somewhere in their yeah. data as well. So it, it's pointing towards, it could be new physics that could yeah. bring those two evidence piles together. It also changes when the universe will end, which seems like a good thing to know. Because whatever this Hubble constant turns out to be, this expansion rate determines the fate of the universe. Now, by all accounts, the universe is expanding much faster than the gravity could possibly pull it back together. So that kind of rules out the idea that gravity would slow the expansion and bring it back down to a big crunch and then, you know, a singularity and big bang over and over again, a, a cyclic universal model, basically. That went out the window a long time ago. We now know that galaxies will continue to spread further and further apart. The light's slowly going out as all the stars go out over time until eventually it's just nothing but a bunch of black holes radiating out Hawking radiation for a Google years. The dreaded big freeze. The Hubble constant determines how that's going to play out as well. So this has created the cosmological crisis that we're currently dealing with. And like I said before, these are just two ways of measuring it. There are many others. There's one that involves red giants that uh, produce its own number. They started using gravitational waves now that we can detect gravitational waves as a method. And that's produced its own numbers. And none of these are agreeing with each other. And nobody knows why. But there are theories, and one of the theories has to do with a, a quirk in the geometry of the universe. The question of whether the universe is flat or curved has been debated for decades now, and I'll be honest, this is where my brain starts to melt, so how about I just uh, <laughs> let Dr. Becky take this one? Yeah, so when we talk about cosmology, we're always talking about you know fitting this cosmological model to the data that we have, coming up with the model that how much stuff is in there and, and what shape is the universe so that we go from cosmic micro background to what we see now. And the, the shape or the geometry of the universe is actually a big factor. Now there's a lot of evidence locally that says, suggests that the, the universe has what we call flat geometry, which means that if we set two parallel lines going, they'll never meet ever in the universe. They will always remain parallel. But the paper that came out back in 2019 that was like crisis in cosmology tried to fix the crisis by saying, okay, the universe doesn't have to be flat. What if the geometry of the universe was closed or had this idea of positive curvature, which would mean that if you set two parallel lines going, they would meet eventually mm. because of the shape that they're traveling over. So like on a sphere, like on Earth, for example, longitudinal lines, they're parallel at the equator, they meet at the poles, right? My brain's starting to melt. I knew this would happen. <laughs> so yeah, basically in a curved universe, lines would eventually cross each other, whereas in a flat universe, they would never cross. They would stay parallel forever. But if the universe is expanding, then wouldn't those lines go away from each other, which wouldn't that be negative curvature? My head hurts. These are just ways of saying that the geometry of the universe would affect the way the Hubble constant gets measured, maybe even differently in different places. So that's an option. Now there is one other explanation, and that's just that maybe there's some new physics we just haven't discovered yet. You know, Newton revolutionized physics with his laws of motion. Einstein created another revolution with relativity. And maybe there's another revolution out there just beyond the horizon of our knowledge that could put an end to all this and explain it all and create a whole new field of science in the process. A whole new field of science that would probably open up a lot of doors to new opportunities and technologies that we can't even think of now. Jetpacks, finally. I'll let Dr. Becky chime in on this. I thought she had a really interesting thing to say here. But in terms of like, you know, why bother in the first place? Um, my thing is always like, well, just curiosity. Like, why did we sure. cross that ocean? Why did we climb that mountain? Like, because you want to know, right? You want to ex expand the boundary of human knowledge. But also I think the secondary thing is you just don't know what's going to come out of that kind of research, right? Like mm. by pushing to have say better telescopes or better ways of analyzing the data or better image reduction, there are so many things that can, that can come out of, of that digital cameras, like CCDs, these, these chips that go in digital cameras were pushed forward by astronomers being like, we don't want to use film anymore. It's not good scientifically. You can't record the exact brightness of something. You only record like in a, you know, like a, difference in brightness across a plate kind of thing uh and also you know better ways of um transferring data and wi-fi came out of that you know like that all came from astronomy and now we're in a, an era where especially in radio astronomy but they're taking data 
at a faster rate than they can get the data off the servers and onto their computer. Oh, wow. You know, because they're pushing like a uh, computer. People, can you sort this out? Because we, we literally can't get the data fast enough. That's going to increase, you know, data transfer mm. times, which I'm sure everyone will be happy for, you know, it'll speed up many transactions across the world in terms of sure. like finance or even calls like this. Analyze that data. The image techniques might go into medical imaging or they might go into sort of like analyzing CCTV footage, you, you know, all this kind mm. of stuff that... Astronomy really is the, an imaging science. So anything to do with imaging might somehow benefit from people saying, I want to know the age of the universe, which I think is a fun thing to say. Like you don't know necessarily, and you can't call it now what it's going to be, but indirectly they will somehow benefit. So as crises go, the cosmological crisis is probably not the most important one going on out there right now, but it means a lot in the world of astrophysics, and by finding an answer to it, it could open up some amazing opportunities for the future. So I want to say thanks again to Dr. Becky for setting me straight on this. It was a really fun time talking to her. I am going to release the entire interview on Thursday, so if you're watching this in the future, I'll link it up down in the description or put a little thing up here, but uh, definitely go check that out. We go uh, further into depth on this topic, but also just other things like just what it's like to be an astrophysicist and whatnot. It was a really good time, and, and uh, I really enjoyed talking to her. And also while you're at it, go check out our YouTube channel. She does a really great job of breaking down these big science topics into chunks that you and I can actually understand. It's, it's a rare talent for somebody who actually has a PhD in this kind of stuff to be able to do that. But yeah, however we find an answer to this, it's likely to be a huge aha moment in science. You know, a moment where somebody was able to connect disparate ideas that hadn't been connected before and come up with a new idea that blows everybody's minds. But aha moments are important in any job, so if you would like to figure out how to create more aha moments in your life, I can highly recommend the class Creative Breakthrough, Eight Exercises to Power Your Creativity, Confidence, and Career on Skillshare. Created by Danielle Cursa, a former art blogger turned author and artist, she talks about the aha moments that occur when creating art, the moments that different ideas intersect and you can suddenly see something you didn't see before. And she's figured out how to basically hack your brain to develop these aha moments through eight exercises that are sure to jumpstart your creativity and inspire amazing ideas. In this class, you'll figure out how to find your creative superpower that makes you unique and capitalize on it, and how to build tools to break through creative blocks so you don't have to rely on motivation and simple strategies to find your voice and carve your own path. These are lessons that apply to art, but also writing, research, or really anything you're passionate about and want to make a bigger part of your life. This is, of course, just one of the thousands of classes on Skillshare, covering everything from business essentials, graphic design, marketing, video production, cooking, basically anything you're interested in, there's an expert ready to teach it to you on Skillshare. So join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer. The first 1,000 people to sign up at the link in the description below can get unlimited access to thousands of classes completely free for two months. Yeah, I've learned a lot from Skillshare over the years and actually learned a lot from this uh, Creative Breakthrough class, stuff that I'm going to be applying to making videos on here. So I can, I can definitely recommend it. So yeah, links down in the description, two months free, Skillshare, go check it out. All right, thanks to Skillshare for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are supporting this channel, building a community, being awesome. I got some new people to shout out real quick. Let me murder their names. We got Wallace Boz. Here we go. Bjorn Ockels Burke Soongard. I think I got it. Sean Jones, Mad. Mads. Uh, Doug Rogers, Bob Hartley, Chris Glover, John Brewer, Gretar Hannenson, uh, Greg Miller, Kieran Wilton, David Yahashikal, uh, Lorke I. Zorica, <laughs> Michael Lang Langimar, wow, you guys are killing me today, uh, Brett Tepperstra, and Ben Schaefer. Nailed all of that. Uh, if you would like to join them, get early access to videos, and just join an awesome community, uh, I invite you to go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. T-shirts available at the store at answerswithjoe.com slash store. There's also hoodies, mugs, posters, stickers, just all kinds of stuff. Lots of designs. I only wear a few of them on here. There's dozens more of these. They're designed by an amazing artist in Prague who is uh, uh, helping me out. So this supports him. It also supports the channel, and it's also just cool gear. So uh, answerswithjoe.com slash store. Go check it out. Please like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, Google thinks you'll like this one, so maybe go see what that's all about, uh, or any of the others on the side over here that have my face on it. And if you like them, I do invite you to subscribe. I'll come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening week, stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.